So, so this slide is the inspiration for the title of today's webinar. It's a banner that was created. Um, it's a replication, replica of a banner that was created during the um, Anaganish movement, which started in the 1920s here in Nova Scotia. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about the Anaganish movement um, in my introduction, but um, to see to see the banner and the inspiration um, was important to kind of give a sense of the history and the significance throughout time of the to think, to learn, to do for social change. And if you're interested, and I know some of you are also graduates of the Cody Institute, as well as graduates of the Masters of Adult Education program and students of the Cody or students of the Masters of Adult Education program here, programs here at St. Francis Xavier University, there's currently, um, we are accepting applications at the Cody for the courses you see um, on the slide as well, we're um, accepting applications for courses in the Masters of Adult Education programs, um, and particularly right now is open for the new cohort in Adult Education, Women's Leadership and Community Development. And we'll be posting links for these programs and applications in the chat shortly. Okay. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, we're still waiting for one speaker to join us. And um, I don't see her here. Uh, but we're going to get going because we appreciate your your time and the time of the speakers and there's lots to, to listen to and to share. So I'll begin. My name, um, I'd like to begin by saying welcome everyone from around the world on behalf of the Cody International Institute and St. Francis Xavier University's Department of Adult Education. I thank you for joining us today. I begin by acknowledging that I, the Cody International Institute and St. Francis Xavier University are located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship first signed with the British crown in 1725. Acknowledging relationship to land and peoples, past, present, and future is a call to action to recognize the historical injustices and genocide of indigenous peoples and ongoing discriminations and inequalities that are experienced um, by indigenous peoples in Canada. And also recognizing that indigenous peoples around the world have been affected by colonization due to the long-standing realities and legacies of, of colonization. I also acknowledge the necessity of action and advocacy for reconciliation in building right relationships with Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, learning, unlearning, critical thinking and reflection, individual, collective and societal is imperative to reconciliation and building a just society for all. I am Dr. Robin Neustader, program teaching staff at the Cody International Institute and an assistant professor of adult education uh, in the Faculty of Education of St. Francis Xavier University. If you've been noticing the chat, you'll see that Jenny has been posting some Zoom notes to be mindful of in regards to making the best of this Zoom experience during the webinar. Um, I also just wanna highlight a few so this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the Cody YouTube channel. Please feel free, and I see some of you have already been doing this, but please feel free to post your name and where you're joining us from in the chat. Um, in the chat, you can also post comments, reflections, and questions for the speakers um, and to share with everybody who is here. So I see you already have over 100 and we have 107 people with us today. This, so this is fantastic. I'm very excited. Thank you so much. Um, you can submit questions to the speakers. We'll have a Q&A session at the, after all the speakers have shared. So you can submit questions in the chat or you can submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom. Closed captioning is available. Um, 
along the bottom on the three dots over the, if you click on where it says more with three dots, you can see um, a closed captioning or titles option. You can turn this on and off for yourself. So as you saw earlier, the, the banner from the Annie Ganesh movement that, inf that inspired the title for this webinar today. So a little bit about the Annie Ganesh movement for people who don't know, it, as I noted, it began in the 1920s and carried on for several decades. Um, so over a hundred years ago, and it started a learning and community development revolution here in the Maritimes of Canada, of people coming together to learn in study circles, workshops, conferences, and dialogue to become agents of their own destiny. So they studied cooperatives, credit unions, home economics, adult education, and more. Thousands of miners, farmers, small business owners, foresters, homemakers, men and women from across the region took part. Word of these study circles and successful cooperatives and credit unions spread around the world. And soon people were coming from all over the globe to this rural community of Aniganish here in Nova Scotia to see what was happening and why it was being so successful. This legacy of adult learning for community development continues through the Cody International Institute and the Department of Adult Education at St. Francis Xavier University. Like all good things, they evolve as per the socio-cultural, economic, political, and technological circumstances and realities. Due to the pandemic, our programs have moved to online and we look forward to meeting and learning together in all ways, in person, in virtual, and physical spaces. We will share the links to the Cody Education and Master Educa Masters of Adult Education programs in the chat. Now on to our phenomenal speakers and why I think we're all here today. So we're gonna try to travel around the world following the sun to hear from our speakers. And our first speakers are Samita Baknagar and Kapila Bahilabai Vankar from the Self-Employed Women's Association in India. Smita is the senior, senior coordinator of the Self-Employed Women's Association, also known as SEWA, an organization and a movement comprising of 1.7 million informal sector women members across 16 states of India. Currently, Smita heads the SEWA Manager Journey School, the training arm of SEWA, which strengthens the managerial, technical, and soft skills of grassroots women in their micro enterprises. Some of her key initiatives include identifying and developing needs-based content, delivering training, leading the training module digitization project, and setting up livelihood linkages and developing a cadre of grassroots master trainers. Kabila Ben is a small, far, small and manager, marginal farmer and agricultural worker from Rasno village in Nanad district. She is an elected president of Sewa since 2011. She is a tenured lead master trainer and she is part of the training team wherein she has attended train the trainer programs on managerial soft skills and technical trainings. She has been instrumental in training and mentoring young master trainers as well Capilla trains teams to plan, operate, run and manage the activities at community learning business resource centers across various nations, locations nationally. She has trained more than 2000 members nationally and internationally. And Smita will be translating for Kapila. So Smita and Kapila, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Great. Can you turn on your video, Smita? Does that work? There we go. We see you. Fantastic. Eleven can also start. Eleven video on Karisha So I will start and then have Kapila Ben share. That sounds great. Namaste, everyone. So glad to be here today with the introduction of Antigonish. I think we can relate very well with each other because the objective purpose has always been the same. SEVA is a community-based organization and uh, we are a member-based organization with women from informal economy, members who are organized 
and seva believes in full employment and self reliance of our members and for which we have always uh, worked on sustainability of our members and when we say economic and self reliance it is uh, not just the women but the entire family and how they can become reliant in all the possible ways so um, we are a family of organizations we have cooperatives we have for profit and not for profit companies in our fold and our members themselves are the owners and managers of their own trades uh, and we have members coming from i'm talking way back 15 years back when we had members coming from semi literate and illiterate backgrounds we have our own cooperative bank as well run by our members so uh, basically um, seva believes in uh, capacity building and uh, training right from the beginning because in any trade or any vocation how can we uh, strengthen the skills and help them become sustainable in the long run as well and we believe in collective organizing so our uh, micro entrepreneurs mostly have collective uh, ownership so our members in the are in the committee of the part of the cooperatives they are the shareholders in the board and uh, holding many other positions all federations are autonomous bodies so when i say we are family of organization we have more than 140 uh, 40 cooperatives in our pool and companies as well all run by our members so there was a felt need and basically everybody is managing the their own associations having their own um, legal bodies so there was a felt need that we from the members and we've been part of several boards we have been signing many balance sheets and audit reports we need to learn the ropes of it so we are good in our own trade but how do we to become good managers good entrepreneurs and that's how our own members establish their own school which we call it as seva managers school and our master trainers also come from the grassroots the community itself all our modules are also developed in a participatory way with our uh, members so we have partnerships at on one hand with the expert institutes and on the second hand we have partnership with our own members so we work together to develop the whole tools and pedagogies to deliver the concepts of the management we may not call it the name per se but we how do the meaning of the concept get translated to our members how can we explain to them the examples and in the own lingo of our members how can they understand so that's how we got established and we have cadre of master trainers more than 5000 master trainers kapil abhin is one of them and the master trainers are also groomed from the community and they are continuously monitored and assessed being trained and we grade them into levels of a b and c in continuous training and we have several courses including a mini mba of ours where we provide uh, these kind of trainings to our members so for i don't think there is any management institute which would give admission to anyone who doesn't have a basic literacy level so our own school brings in the members from all over and today we have around 55 community learning business resource centers through which we disseminate all our trainings trainings through our master trainers so each of the master trainer goes back to their geography and we have a decentralized center through which the trainings are disseminated i'll now request kapila ben to say and i'll be quickly translating kapila ben tame rajwat pasu First of all, let me thank Cody to give me this opportunity to speak here. Uh, I am a small and marginal farmer of Seva, president of Seva, and I am very thankful that you have given us an um, uh, opportunity to speak at this forum. बताओ के जब जारे में सेवा में नता जोड़ा है तारे हमारी हालत चार दीवार में अंदर हाथी पर तारे में कोई दिशा नहीं मारती जीवन में आगर बदवा माटे का जीवा माटे 
બીજું બતાવું તો ખરેખર આમ એમ પર થતું તું કે કંઈક આગળ જવું હોય તો કોની પાસેથી આમ સમજવું કે કેવી રીતે વાત કરવી એ કશું જ અમને ખબર નથી પણ સેવામાં જ્યારે જોડાયા તો અમને પહેલા ને પહેલા તો તાલીમો આપવામાં આવી એક તો આગેવાનની હોય લીડરશીપની હોય માર્કેટિંગની હોય એટલે જેમ જેમ અમને ખબર પડતી ગઈ એમ એમ અમને સેવા મેનેજર સ્કૂલ દ્વારા તાલીમો મળતી ગઈ Uh, so Kapila Bhatti is saying that when we became members of Seva, we understood the direction for our growth. We could find the pathways for us to grow by getting various trainings, especially mentioning about leadership, costing and marketing through the Seva Managers School. Mm -hmm. Akapila. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. જેમ જેમ તાલીમ અમને મળતી ગઈ એમ એમ એવું નહીં કે તાલીમ લઈને અમે અમારા સીમિત રાખી કેમ કે હું એ સેવા મેનેજરની સ્કૂલમાંથી જે તાલીમ લીધી એમાંથી હું એક માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર બની અને માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર એવી રીતે બની અને એ જ તાલીમોમાંથી મને એક ખેતીની તાલીમ મળી દાખલા તરીકે મારા પોતાનું તમને એક ઉદાહરણ આપું કે હું માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર બની તો એમાંથી જ્યારે હું ખેતી કરતી હતી તો મને કોઈ ખેડૂત પાસેથી કે કોઈની પાસેથી આમ દિશા જોતી તો કોઈ મળતી નથી પણ જ્યારે મેં તાલીમ લીધી તો હું પોતે મારા આખા ખેતરની જે હું પહેલાં જે કામ ખેતરમાં ઉત્પાદન કરતી હતી એનાથી મેં અલગ રીતે કર્યું અને મેં આખી લીલીની ખેતીનું પરિવર્તન કરી નાખ્યું પહેલાં હું જે પાક કરતી હતી એમાં હું નિષ્ફળ જતી હતી પણ જ્યારે મેં લીલીની ખેતી કરી તો એમાં મને ફાયદાકારક રહ્યું એમ So uh, it's not that we. I took the training, and I realized that this training is very important for all our members. So I trained myself. I got myself trained as a master trainer, so that I could provide training to more such sisters in my village and nearby. So if I share about myself, basically I'm a farmer, and I would have remained a small and marginal farmer. But when I got these trainings, I realized that I can grow at this level, uh, grow in farming as well. And when, through the trainings, I got an idea that I can go into lily farming. जीवन Seva believes a lot in sister-to-sister -sister training. So when I get trained, I train several other members, not only in my own state but in various states of the country. And we first of all try to understand what is the need of our member. What kind of trainings do they need? So kind of a training needs assessment we carry out, and then we tailor make our trainings for our members. બીજો ખાસ કે ખાસ તો હું સેવા મેનેજર સ્કૂલનો આભાર માનું છું કેમ કે હું એટલું બધું ભણેલી ગણેલી નથી પણ છતાં બી એક માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર તરીકે હું મને કામ કેવું કે આમ મને એ સન્માન મળ્યું છે કે હું માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર તરીકે છું ને હું ગામમાં જ્યારે તાલીમ આપતી હોય તો એ રીતે હું આપતી હોઉં છું એટલે હું બહુ આભારી છું કેમ કે અત્યારે જો તો અત્યારની જનરેશનમાં ભણતરને ડિગ્રી વધારે જોતા હોય છે પણ ત્રણ જેવી બહેનોની માટે તો માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર બનવું બહુ આમ ગૌરવની વાત હોય છે એટલે હું મેનેજરની સ્કૂલનો બહુ આભાર માનું છું I am not uh, educated. I have not studied. Can you tell me about your Kapila Bin? Eight. I have studied only till class A, but I am so proud to be a teacher. For my, for me, I have. I am a master trainer, so I am kind of respected as a teacher in my community, and I am so happy that even though I am less educated, I am able to learn and also translate the learnings to others. And uh, So it is through Seva Managerial School that I got the opportunity to learn so much and also take the learnings to others. So B, I'm very proud to be the master trainer. બીજું ખાસ કહું કે હું પોતે તો માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર થઈ કે એટલી આગળ વધી પણ ગામના સભ્યોને પણ અત્યારે અમારા ગામના સભ્યો જે માસ્ટર ટ્રેનર થઈ કે કામ કરતા હતા તો અત્યારે એ પણ એની રીતે આગળ વધી રહ્યા છે ધંધાની અંદર એટલે એ રીતે એ રીતે હું તમને ખાસ કહું છું કે અમારા સભ્ય બહેનોના પોતાનામાં શક્તિ વિકાસ ટ્રેનિંગથી તાલીમથી આવ્યો છે અને પોતે આગળ પણ નીકળી રહ્યા છે એ કોઈની સામે બોલી નતા શકતા એ અત્યારે બોલતા પણ થયા છે તો હું એ પણ કહેવા માંગુ છું અને બીજું હું ખાસ કહું છું કે સેવાની અંદર જ્યારે અમે હતા ત્યારે તો બહુ ઓછું ભણેલા હતા टेक्नोलॉजी ज्ञान आवड़त है जय तालीमो लैर कर बोलता है आगे दिशा मिलती हो So with our trainings, we are continuously taught uh, taught to think to do things differently. 
how can we convert with the various challenges to um, make it into an opportunity and i would like to specifically mention that how do we take the technology to the grassroots is something that, something that we have taken up and especially now that younger generation members are becoming members of seva they have more a different profile they are educated than us they know technology better than us but we are blending our efforts together we teach them our values and principles and they teach us technology so this is how we are going together as a pair and taking our trainings forward બીજો ખાસ તો તો ગામડાની સ્થિતિ એવી છે કે ગામડામાં પોતાની દીકરી 11 કે 12 10 8 ભાગ્ય જ ભણેલી હોય છે અને મા-બાપ ડરતા હોય છે કે સમાજની સામે તો એ પણ અમે તાલીમમાં આવરી લેતા હોય છે જ્યારે અમારી યંગ પેઢી એ લોકોની સાથે જાય છે અને એમને જાય તાલીમ આપે છે યુવા પેઢીને ત્યારે એ લોકોના મેમ થાય છે કે ના ખરેખર આ દીકરી આટલું ભણીને આગળ વધી છે તો એ જોઈને પણ અમારા સભ્યો પોતાની દીકરોને ભણાવતા થયા છે સાથે એક પોતાની દીકરોને સેવામાં આવતા પણ કર્યા છે અને અમારી દીકરીઓ અત્યારે તમે જો તો જિલ્લાઓમાં તો તાલીમ આપે છે પોતાના ગામોમાં તો તાલીમ આપે છે પણ અત્યારે રાજ્યોમાં પણ એ તાલીમ આપવા માટે એમના મા બાપ મોકલી રહ્યા છે so today we have also brought in soft skills trainings to our members the young especially the younger generation members because we took an assessment of our micro entrepreneurs and to see whether how their enterprises were progressing and we realized that lot of soft skill training also were needed so we have introduced that whole range of training secondly our younger generation members also face security issues in terms of especially they were young girls and could not move around a lot so we had to do lot of those kind of trainings also and today they are not only going and providing trainings in their own villages but also in the neighboring states and also different countries especially the south asian countries the south countries એટલે અત્યારે અમારા શ્રમજીવી બહેનોના જે દીકરા હોય દીકરીઓ હોય તો એ ભણેલા તો હોય પણ એમને કેવું કે દુનિયાનું જ્ઞાન ને ચોપડીનું જ્ઞાન હોય છે જ્યારે એમને જીવનમાં આગળ વધવા અમારા દીકરીઓને અમારે બહુ સ્ટ્રોંગ બનાવી પડે છે કેમ કે અત્યારથી જ આવા વાતાવરણો થઈ રહ્યા છે નવી તકલીફો આવી રહી છે તો એની સામે અમારી પેઢીને કેવી રીતે ટકાઈ રાખવી એટલે એને અમારા તાલીમો દ્વારા તૈયાર કરવા પડે છે એટલે અમારા જે શ્રમજીવી બહેનોની દીકરીઓ ખરી અત્યારથી જ એમનું જો અમે સ્ટ્રોંગ કરીશું અને એમના સેવાના જે અમારા મૂલ્યો છે એના આધારે અમે એમને તૈયાર કરીશું તો એમના મજબૂતાઈ આવશે અને એમને વણી લેતા પણ આવડશે અને બીજું શું કે સમાજની સામે ટકી પણ રહેશે પહેલા એવું હોય તો જો દીકરી બહાર જાય તો લોકો ચર્ચાઓ કરે તો એના ડરથી મા બાપને આ નીકળવા દે પણ જ્યારે અમે લોકો તાલીમમાં એ બધું જ એમના મા બાપની સાથે રાખતા હોઈએ છીએ દીકરીઓને રાખતા હોય છે એમના ભાઈઓને રાખતા હોય છે તો એવી રીતે તાલીમ કરે છે તો એમના મા બાપને અને એમની ભાઈઓને એમને બધાને ખબર પડે છે કે સેવા જેવી સંસ્થા છે ને સેવાનો વિશ્વાસ બહુ અગત્યનો છે ને એ વિશ્વાસ અમે ક્યારેય તોડતા નથી so our trainings are as i was also sharing in the beginning it is not just the bookish knowledge but lot of practical knowledge is inbuilt so whenever we are doing the trainings we also do the on the job training our own enterprises are providing apprenticeship and internship to the other members so they can learn the ropes of the entire value chain and we also give them the confidence by hand holding them till they are able to establish their own enterprise so this is what is what seva's approach is so that it becomes sustainable in the long run it does take time it is a slow process but at the end it gets the whole strength because it is very uh, owner the ownership comes there and it is a very participatory thing and that's where and seva's trust is also strengthened and we for us we hand hold them till we are confident that they can be left alone i'm talking about the micro entrepreneur so ખાસ એટલા માટે કે સેવામાં ખાલી બહેનો જ કામ કરે છે એટલા એમના માતા પિતાને પણ ખબર હોય છે કે સેવામાં ખાલી બહેનો જ કામ કરે છે અને એમના સેવા પર એટલો વિશ્વાસ છે કે સેવાની બહેનો સાથે મારી દીકરી જશે તો કંઈક આગળ એના જીવનમાં વધશે અને અમારી પાસે એટલા ઉદાહરણ પણ છે કે અમારી જે નવી પેઢીની દીકરીઓ અમારી સાથે અત્યારે જોડેલી છે એ લોકોને સેવામાં કામ કરવાનો બહુ રસપ્રદ લાગે છે and we are providing and we we are the couple of minutes describing a little bit on the young women training that we do so here most of many times the families do not want to send their uh, young girls for training so we go to their villages form the entire batch and since we are all women it becomes little easier and we include the family members also in the first days to watch our trainings to see what they are training tra- teaching them because that's not what i mean there's lot of things going on in the uh, current situation so they also want to gain confidence on that so that's how we gain the strength by uh, women to women gathering together taking the whole family as a unit but under the leadership of women 
ઉટરીક <laughs> Uh, there are other new emerging needs also coming up other than these trainings because it's an uh, era of technology and even the language now english is also a language that everyone uh, finds it essential and we are putting that also in our courses so that we can understand and learn from each other ana khas a taalim athi evu nahi smita ben ke aap taalim athi khali bhanto nu nenu jnan apta hoy che par behno ne dhandao karva koi pan nana nana dhandao ma thi emne rozgari marte to eni par apna taalim emne apta hoy che બીજું કે એમને અલગ કેવું કોઈની સાથે આપણે વાત કેવી રીતે કરવી હોય તો એની સાથે એની આપણે તાલીમ આપતા હોય છે એટલે આપણે જે જે એમ આપણે સંગઠન કરતા જાય છે જેમ જેમ બહેનોની માંગ આવતી હોય એ રીતે આપણે તાલીમ આપે છે એટલે બહેનોના સેવા મેનેજરની સ્કૂલ ઉપર પૂરો વિશ્વાસ છે એ લોકો તાલીમો લેવા તૈયાર હોય છે અને ગામડામાં પણ એટલી ફૂલ સંખ્યામાં પણ હાજર હોય છે થેન્ક યુ એન્ડ બાય સેઇંગ ધેટ ઓલ आवर ટ્રેનિંગ્સ આર નીડ બેઝ એન્ડ ડિમાન્ડ ડ્રિવન એન્ડ વી ઓર હેલ્પ ધેમ ટુ સ્ટ્રેન્ધન ધેર એન્ટરપ્રાઇઝીસ વી ગો देयर ટુ ધ એક્સ્ટેન્ડ ધેટ ધે કેન Uh, from the loss to the profit level they can reach by inserting all the other um, uh, trainings like even how do you negotiate how do you market how do you understand the market how do you do segmentation etc kind of things and that's how uh, our members build the trust on us that these uh, women are not going to leave us till we are confident as you matano abhar manu chu mara vishwas sabhi matano abhar manu chu on behalf of all my 17 20 lakh members i thank you all thank you thank you so much smita and kapila so now moving on we're going to travel to the african continent um specifically we're going to take ourselves to south africa where our next speaker sara Uh, Rai Cleef, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correct, Sarah, who is based in South Africa, is joining us from. She is the Gen Secretary General of the International Federation of Workers Education Associations. This, uh, the IFWEA, brings together a global network of NGOs and education institutions providing education and research and trade unions in communities and educational um, In, and education institutions. The Secretary General, she was elected uh, at a global conference of its affiliates. Um, the Secretary General is elected every four years. And Sarah has served in this position since 2007 and has been elected for her fourth and final term for 2019 to 2023. Sarah is also an adjunct instructor of the Labor Studies and Employment Relations Department of the School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers University in New Jersey, USA. She has produced research for the department and teaches the course for their Labor Studies degree on social movements, social change, and work. She is an experienced labor educator and researcher, has been a commentator and analyst on trade union and civil society performance and strategy in Southern Africa for over three decades. She is the former director of the Labor Research Service, LRS, and still represents the LRS as a chairperson of the DITI Kenny, an ethical investment fund committed to long-term sustainability of South African NGOs. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robin, and thank you very much for inviting me um, to present the International Federation of Workers' Education Associations. which we call if we are for short, um, and that is what I'm going to do. Uh, Brian, may I have the first slide? Thank you. So firstly, who and what is if we are? If we are is a global federation of worker educators that has been in existence since 1947. Um, initially started by European and North American worker educator, organizations attached to labor uh, parties and movements 
um, it's grown and changed significantly over the years. So even though I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa, and the Secretariat is here as well, um, we're an international federation, and we have affiliates in different countries, one of which is the Indian Academy of Self-Employed Women, which services SEWA. Um, so it's very really nice to be sharing a platform um, with sisters from SEWA. And uh, uh, worker education associations differ. They're not all uh, of servicing trade unions or trade unions themselves. Some of them, like the big WEAs in the Nordic countries and in the UK, um, work in community education. So we try as the Secretariat to find those programs that we can offer um, that are robust enough that everybody can benefit from it. Um, if we are, as a federation is governed by its affiliates, it has a formal conference every four years and elects its leadership. And it has a particularly unique status within the labor movement because um, we have formal affiliation to the ILO, to its conference, to UNESCO, and we also share a joint partnership with um, SOLIDA, which is a platform of labor uh, servicing organizations in Europe. In North America, our affiliate is the United Association of Labor Educators. Currently, we don't have a Canadian affiliate, which is why I leapt at the opportunity um, to actually share a platform with you and your students and alumni. Um, we also do have some members of the UALE which work in our core program, such as the Rutgers um, Labor Studies Department or the Labor School of UCLA or the Empire State College in New York and Penn State's Labor School as well, who besides being members of the UALE also interact with our affiliates in various forums. May I have the next slide? What motivates us, these very diverse uh, forms of uh, education institutions, from those attached to labor, to those attached to global unions, to those working in community education? Essentially, uh, all of us, all our affiliates have a relationship of some sort or the other to their national or a global labor organization. And they're united by wanting to build a conscious and diverse global labor movement. Um, within that, we are education organizations. And so we want to make sure that we share and engage each other uh, to continuously inform ourselves on a type of popular education which is rooted in values, the values of the labor movement. And we try to avoid categorizing that into a particular type of political association. But in general, it is the broader social democratic socialist approach and anything from the very left um, to the center within that uh, uh, environment. Um, many of the programs that we have are equipping our affiliates to equip the worker organizations that they work with to respond to these changes in the labor market that have led to a, an expansion of survivalist economic activity and the deregulation of, of uh, 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 large sections of the working population. And that that has led to a decline in class and communal solidarity and a, 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 some, it's called different things in different countries. Um, but creating silos where people only work according to a particular identity and don't see the commonality between them. So we consciously try to build on what are the unifying and generic elements um, that involve everybody who either, whether they're in the community, in the workplace, or in uh, activists and non-profit organizations are working to deal with those who are on the margins of the economy. May I have the next slide? And we do this through uh, recalibrating a form of education which is very uh, old, um, which is worker education or adult and continuous education or liberal education. It's called different things. 
in different contexts and in different countries. Um, and the recalibration is to ensure that firstly, um, people's observations and uh, the information that they impart through their education and the knowledge that they are developing actually conforms to the current reality, that they're not wistfully uh, uh, trying to educate people on what was without also acknowledging what is. Um, because if we do that, then what we're doing is we are not really becoming a force for change as educators. Um, and then secondly, to assist the leaders of labor organizations from the traditional uh, trade unions to the new forms of labor, such as SEWA, and even community-based organizations which are connected with uh, working people or a working uh, uh, identity, a working class identity, to develop the narrative that actually deals with the current reality and which crafts an imagined future um, that they are prepared to put their energies and work behind. And in the doing of that, we focus on building coalitions and relationships between traditional and new forms of organizations and between formal structures and trade unions and member organizations and a nonprofit and campaign organizations who work together. So much of our work tries to bring different people from different aspects of uh, uh, organizing in the 21st century together through the learning events that we structure. Um, in terms of the next slide, which is content, context, um, the one immediately after this one, thank you. We have to acknowledge that um, what the current reality, and it's been intensified by uh, of the pandemic and the economic constraints that have gone with lockdowns over the past year and a half, has led to uncertainty um, and anxiety in the working population that our affiliates um, are in contact with and have trusted relationships with. Um, and that there is a breakdown of the social fabric um, of what used to be known as working communities um, and a breakdown even within the workplace between the various divisions of, of categories of work um, in, 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 in the labor market. And um, we also have to acknowledge that there's an intensification of uh, political divisions, imbalances, inequality, and this is the environment that we work in. And then lastly, with the pandemic, we're faced with the fact that we've got to put greater emphasis on the use of digital tools and methods. Now, we were prepared for this without any notion of a pandemic um, for almost a decade, purely because of the lack of resources um, that our affiliates had, especially in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, the shrinking of resources for worker education, trade union education, community-based education in general, as well as the increase of digital communication um, and the fact that our affiliates often didn't have the means to equip themselves to utilize these digital tools. So we designed a um, uh, open source uh, platform for popular education and labor education, which we called OLA, Online Labor Academy. And we work with the most grassroots organizations like the Indian Academy of Self-Employed Women um, for them to put work that they were doing face-to-face, -face, transform it into a hybrid form where some went on the online academy and some they still did face-to-face. -face. And this has literally been our program for the past 10 years. Um, and we, when we started this program, it was only the North American and uh, uh, European organizations that did any form of what was then called distant learning. And now it's every affiliate that we have does some form of online education. Currently with the pandemic, we flooded by many other trade unions that we have been saying for ages, you can do better campaigning, you can do better communication, if you transform some of your education in that regard online. And here we have an open source platform for you to do so. 
um, and we can provide you with all the education you want to do so. And we have done work for the past 10 years on making popular methods integrated into the work that you're doing online. Uh, and some of the work that we've done in doing that is now coming to very good use. Now, it's not a quick thing to do. I mean, some of you are academics and you have in the past two years had to move most of your education online. Um, and you know, just from your own experiences that that is not always easy. When you are dealing with people that have very little access to digital tools, computers, uh, smartphones, etc., and you want them to transfer what they are doing face to face, elements of it, as many elements as possible, to what they can support and afford um, through uh, IT and technology, um, it takes a lot of coaxing, a lot of breaking down the anxiety and mentoring all along the way to do so. And that is the work that we've been doing with our affiliates in Latin America, Asia and um, Africa over the past decade. And we've just scaled it up um, for this year. So to give you some idea of what we do, and I'm just going to show you the course program for this year. We have a small secretariat. We are two educators, both, um, uh, both qualified in online uh, uh, learning and curriculum development. And then myself as the general secretary that does a lot of the design work and two administrators to support us. And we have this cohort of young people that we have run through a program which we call the Youth Globalization Awareness Program for the past seven years bringing them to Cape Town to do an immersion in seminar and working in field work with new movements. Um, because we use Cape Town as a global example of global inequality. The, the statistics in South Africa of the gap between the rich and the poor conform as an almost mirror image of the rich and poor countries globally. So by bringing people from all over the world to Cape Town and firstly having dialogue between one another for a few weeks through seminar, a few, for a week through seminar discussions and then placing them as field work in organizations that with very little constraints and with a lot of constraints and very little resources still manage to engage the problems that they face um, in organizing and mobilizing um, we're building what we call a young, uh, a group of young leaders for the future who will recraft solidarity, global solidarity, with an understanding of what, um, what you face um, in the developing countries when you organize. Um, so that is what YGAP is. So this is the, I'm just going to run quickly through these courses. All these courses are available on the Online Labour Academy. Um, and besides these, there are many other courses that have been done in previous years. They all follow your informal education format of having 15 learning hours, um, usually run over a three-day workshop, um, but this time run however the participants think um, is convenient to do the course. And we work as a secretariat with facilitators of our affiliates in different countries, and then they work with the member-based organizations and trade unions offering the same course again. Um, the courses are divided into three categories. The first category is called Foundation Skills for Social Change, and those categories are popular methodologies and digital methodologies um, that can be used. So I'll give you a couple of titles because they don't feature very strongly in this year's um, um, calendar, course calendar. There's uh, popular methods of theater for social change, where a Zimbabwean organization that does amazing work um, picking up on social issues through the use of theater have designed a course um, that honestly is one of the best courses for action theater that I've seen yet and could easily be picked up and applied in other countries. There's popcorn and politics, which is a uh, a, a, a film, uh, a popular film organization which designed the ABC of being able to create your own films 
and it provide education through that. And then there's a number of courses that the Secretariat educators develop, participatory learning methods, how to conduct a WhatsApp course, building trade union company networks, um, how to promote uh, political participation and agency in youth, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the foundation skills for social change courses. These courses, we're focusing on three themes, which are our themes up until 2023 that we have chosen. They are violence and harassment in the workplace towards the adoption of, uh, of ILOC 190. Um, then there's the effects of climate change on the poor, and that is where uh, organizations in, of the working poor um, actually highlight how climate change is affecting their work and the uh, uh, accumulation of, of uh, uh, some kind of livelihood. And then there is, there is uh, protecting the rights of migrant workers. Um, those are our three themes. And then, of course, running through those themes are the demand-driven skills that our affiliates uh, uh, have to provide to trade unions, which is information for collective bargaining, tools and methods for organizing, tools and methods for communication. So the first, the, the left column of the slide are the courses that the Secretariat educators provide to facilitators in our affiliates. The right courses on the slide are those that our affiliates provide to their trade union support in their countries. Um, and the focus is very heavily on affiliates that we have in Latin America, in Asia, and in Africa. And then what is not here, it's in one line here, are the work we do with the global unions, especially Africa and Latin America, to support the work that they do with their affiliates, which is everything from um, webinars to roundtable discussions to opening up dialogues. Now, anybody can go onto www.ifwaonline.org and sign up as a guest to have a look at what is there. Um, we offer this platform free to any organization um, that does uh, education for member-based organizations. And they can contact us if you go to the last slide. Um, our secretariat email address is there and the website is there. I could, of course, go into detail about many of these courses, and I'd love to have conversation with some of the participants that are here. So I'm hoping we will hear from you in the future. Uh, there will never not be the need for face-to-face -face education uh, uh, in uh, adult and continuing education. Um, but what can be achieved through utilization of digital tools is quite amazing. The most important thing is that you don't lose the value, you don't lose the participative methodology, and that you provide the support and resources, if it means buying data for your uh, facilitators and for your worker organizations, if it means, like Sewa does, equipping a van and taking it into a village and opening it up and having that screen there and having if it means translating what would be in words into um, um, animation in some form, uh, all of that can be done so that we can utilize our resources as best we can to do what has to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, very rich and a lot of information. And I'm just appreciating all the, and I'm taking notes on commonalities and realities um, that are shared with that I've heard from Samita and Kapila and, and you, Sarah, in regards to the importance of ongoing responsive and effective learning and how community work um, is such, and, and livelihoods are such a important and rich site for learning and that this ongoing um, need to, to think and to learn and to do exactly as, as the slogan of the Anaganish movement said, is still so relevant a hundred years later. So it, it's, yeah, so much is going on in my head right now. I'm, I'm just so thrilled. Thank you so much for that. 
So now we're going to um, jump across the Atlantic Ocean to Canada. Um, before I do that, I just want to let people know that um, our speaker, Lillian Lewindy from the Tanzanian Gender Networking Program is unable to join us today. She's unwell. Um, but we can share some information about their work um, and their community-based knowledge centers um, another time and, and, and also through um, perhaps through our, our CODI's Cody social media. So I'll be working with our communications team so that you can also hear about the fascinating work of TGNP. And thank you for posting that link, Jenny, in the chat. So across the Atlantic Ocean to Canada, and I'm very delighted to have um, our next two speakers joining us who are from the same province where I am located, Nova Scotia, on the Atlantic coast of, of North America, up north. Um, so we have um, Duane Winter and Dr. Ron Milne from the Nova Scotia Brotherhood Initiative, and I'm just going to introduce them and then hand the floor over to them. So Duane is the Community Liaison Coordinator for the Nova Scotia Brotherhood Initiative. He comes to Nova Scotia from Antigua. Prior to joining the Nova Scotia Brotherhood, Duane was a student, studied pharmacy at Howard University in Washington, D.C. and was a health coach for Diabetes Canada. And Dr. Ron Milner was born in Halifax and graduated from the Dalhousie Medical School. Dr. Ron did his family residency practice at Queen's University in 1980 and was a family practice in um, had a family practice in hospital medicine um, in Peterborough, Ontario, and Halifax, Nova Scotia from 1980 to 2021. He is the Nova Scotia Brotherhood physician and also practices geriatric medicine at the Veterans Memorial Hospital in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So, Duane and Dr. Ron, the floor is yours. Okay, well, uh, uh... Ron Milne, uh, maybe I'll start first if I can get my video going here. There we go. Um, so uh, just a little bit about how I uh, came to, to doing this work. Um, my grandfather was uh, one of the first black physicians to graduate from uh, Dalhousie and, and probably uh, in Canada as well. He was uh, a civil rights uh, advocate and uh, social advocate and, and public health advocate as well. Uh, he practiced in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, from my perspective, I started uh, in the community um, in the 1970s before I was in medical school. Um, I, uh, I've always had an interest in social justice and, and public health issues. Uh, I volunteered in Central America I volunteered in uh, the Jane Finch area in Toronto, which is a uh, uh, underserviced, uh, marginalized uh, community with a lot of immigrants. Uh, and I've worked in uh, Northern Ontario with uh, native communities. <clears throat> um, so, so that's a little bit about my background and how I came to be interested in doing this work. Um, with respect to the uh, Black community in Nova Scotia, uh, some of you probably uh, won't be as aware of the, the history here. Um, this is a very old community here that's, that's been in Nova Scotia. The first uh, Black settler, uh, Matthew da Costa, actually set foot in Nova Scotia in 1604. So it, it actually predates um, uh, Black, uh, immigration to the United States. And there are some very old communities here from the 1700s, a number of small black communities in Nova Scotia. The population is just under, of, of uh, black um, uh, people is just under 25,000 in Nova Scotia. Traditionally, the community has been marginalized uh, economically, socially, uh, and, and in many ways. Um, and uh, with black men, uh, we know that the mortality rates in some of the communities uh, have been uh, very unfavorable. And also there are a lot of morbidities, uh, for instance, prostate cancer, vascular diseases, diabetes. Um, there are many conditions that are, that are commoner in uh, the black population. 
Uh, unfortunately, Nova Scotia has not collected any race-based health data, and it's one of the things we've been strongly advocating for uh, with the Brotherhood because we need to have that information. Um, the Brotherhood project is about six years old. I've been the physician um, since, uh, since the program started. Um, our program is really based on the social determinants of health and, and social advocacy, um, where we, we try to make our program Afrocentric, we try to make it holistic and um, community-based. And the reason for this is that traditionally, uh, Black men have not attended uh, uh, medical care a, as often or as soon uh, as they should. Um, and this is a lot of historical basis. Uh, they've felt unwelcome, marginalized, uh, and that their needs were not listened to and not being addressed. So uh, the, the Brotherhood was basically a response to that and a program uh, developed out of um, Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, we do um, <clears throat> have clinics uh, where we, we see uh, men, um, mainly adult men, um, for uh, a variety of, of health problems. Uh, including mental health issues, which has been a big part of our program and has been really uh, exacerbated during uh, the pandemic. Um, but we also do advocacy uh, programs uh, and conferences. We've had, now had three uh, annual Black Men's Health Conferences. The last one was in November uh, 2020, where Dr. Joy DeGruy uh, from the U.S. was our speaker, and we had over a thousand people uh, on that webinar presentation. So uh, it, it was quite a quite a successful um, uh, webinar. Um, in recent times, we've been very active as part of the uh, COVID response team when there was uh, outbreaks of COVID in several of our Black communities, and uh, we helped uh, public health to. Uh, go into the communities and get uh, services in there, including treatment, uh, testing, education, and uh, more recently, um, a vaccine program. So we're quite active in a lot of areas uh, beyond just traditional um, healthcare and, and traditional clinics, though that is um, the basis of our, uh, of our program. Um, we really base our program on relationships uh, and partnerships and relationships, especially in the community, gaining trust, uh, where, as I said, there hasn't been a lot of trust between the black community and the healthcare system. Um, we do a lot of advocacy work and we partner with many different organizations. Uh, Corrections has been one of our uh, major uh, partners, uh, particularly we've had a navigator in the um, courts um, to deal uh, particularly in mental health issues and also in uh, domestic violence. We've done a lot of presentations and education on a variety of different subjects in the communities themselves. Um, we do education, we work with housing, uh, we work with psychiatry very closely. Uh, we work with uh, lawyers on legal issues, including immigration, uh, which has been a big uh, problem for some of our black men who have immigrated here from Africa and the Caribbean and run into legal issues. And then uh, as a result, their, their immigration status is, is threatened. So, um, that's just a, a sample of uh, the things that the Brotherhood does. We're, we're mainly in um, uh, five different communities right now, and we have clinic day uh, on Wednesday where we see patients in these communities, but uh, we're also involved in <clears throat> making house calls. Uh, we're involved in seeing patients in the hospital. Uh, so we have a, you know, a, a broad range of services that we offer. 
Uh, and I think Dwayne is going to uh, expand on that a little bit and talk about uh, some of the programs that we offer. Yes, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having us here today. So as Dr. Ron has given us some information on the uh, Brotherhood, um, in addition to um, having a family doctor with the Brotherhood team, we also have um, a team lead which is like an administrative uh, role. We also have a psychologist, as well as um, a psychiatrist, um, social worker, and a nurse practitioner. All these individuals are um, African descent. So we, in, we envision an Afrocentric approach to our, to our organization. Um, so Dr. Ron also mentioned that we have done some conferences um, which focus on social determinants of health. Um, begin and because of COVID, begin the year we also had a what we call a barbershop talks, where we offered um, free haircuts and shave to men and men and youth, and we provided a safe place for people to come and talk about racism and mental health, because as we know these two are very much intertwined and they affect, racism affects the mental health greatly, especially in this climate. Um, the project lasted about uh, eight weeks and we are actually restarting it this fall. So when we start this fall, we're going to um, try to um, encompass a lot of the universities because a lot of universities do have um, students from all over the world and Racism not only affects um, just black people, but people of East in East Indian, people of Lebanese descent, everything. So we are trying to um, break down that barrier so people can talk, come have a safe place, and just open up about things that bother them um, in regards to living um, here in Canada, away from the family. Um, another thing that uh, we have with the Brotherhood is a men's health league. Now what this is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a virtual meeting we have once weekly um, where it's a peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, very, very intimate, about, only about 10 men, and we'll just come and discuss things that bother us. Um, it could be something from work, home. A lot of men don't wanna talk about their problems, so it gives them a chance to open up to other men and get advice and support from other men. Um, also, we um, this fall, we're going to be starting um, because of COVID, everyone's kind of been in that um, lazy frump. So we're starting a walking group. So we're gonna start have a walking group every week where we go to different communities and get between 15 to 20 individuals and just go for a walk to get out, um, talk, get some fresh air, socialize with your friends again, somewhat social distance, of course. Um, we're also at the present time, we also have a, a podcast going. It's called My Melanin and it's operated right now um, by a group of Dalhousie uh, medical students who they, they put the podcast out to talk about issues that they have faced um, going to university as a black person, uh, male, male and female, also social problems they face as, as black male and females within, the, within uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, another thing that we, we, start, we would start again is also workouts. Because um, a lot of people aren't afraid to go to the gyms. We do Zoom workouts where um, twice a week for 45 minutes, we offer free exercise programs. Um, very basic um, exercises, uh, sit-ups, push-ups, jumping jacks, stretching, Pilates, yoga. Um, it's just to get people moving and feeling like themselves again. And I think uh, that's it, Robin. Any questions from anybody? Thanks. Thanks so much, Dwayne and Dr. Ron. So we're gonna <laughs> open it up to questions after all the speakers. Okay. 
No so problem. we have one more speaker. So people, please feel free to post your questions in the chat um, or hold on to them. Um, you can also post them in the Q&A and we'll get to uh, addressing your questions after our next speaker. So, um, so our final speakers, we are going to travel south from Nova Scotia down to Chile. And I'm delighted to introduce you to Sonia Kovo Barrias Kinderman. I'm sorry, Sonia, if I didn't pronounce your last name correctly. Sonia is a social worker and the executive director of EPES, the foundation since 2015. She has developed advocacy actions to improve public tobacco control policies in Chile and carried out training activities with women who live in poor communities and primary health care teams on popular education, HIV AIDS, communication, sexual and reproductive rights, tobacco control, among others. She currently coordinates the projects Migrants have the right to health. And Angelina Jara Garcia is a psychologist, educator, member of the EPIS Board of Directors. She is responsible for educational activities and health from the perspective of popular education, gender and women's health rights on issues such as HIV AIDS, sexual and reproductive rights, and gender-based violence. She has trained health teams on various topics such as community campaigns, sexual and reproductive rights approaches and tools for effective communication and community work in health. She also has participated in the Chilean Network Against Violence Against Women. 2017, Angelina participated in the Global Change Leaders Program at the Cody Institute and in 2018, she co-facilitated a course here in Aniganish at the Cody on community leadership for women. Since 2011, she has been the coordinator of the International School of Public Health Education carried out um, by the Foundation of EPIS. So I'm going to hand the floor over to you, uh, Sonia and Angelina, and I know you are su supported by one of your colleagues. So the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, please excuse me my English. I want to read some text. Okay. On behalf of EPES, Popular Education in Health Foundation, I'm happy to extend a warm greeting to all of you. I also want to thank the Cody International Institute for inviting us to participate in this webinar, to think, to learn, to do, learning in and for community development. It is an honor for us to be part of this panel discussion to share our experience in popular education and community health in Chile. Our presentation is divided into four parts. First, I will briefly describe who we are and what the EPES Foundation is. Second, we will describe our educational approach that is based on popular education methodology. Third, we will describe one specific EPES project as an example of our work. And we will conclude with some final reflections. But what is EPES? The EPES Foundation is located in Chile. We are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1982 during the military dictatorship to promote health and dignified life through empowerment, mobilization, and collective action, especially for women who live in poor and marginalized communities. Since its beginning, EPES has been an organization led by women who work collaboratively and collectively to carry out our work. We are guided by the belief that it's possible to transform reality through community involvement and social organization. We approach our work with a right to help perspective related to people's living conditions. We work to promote the right to health, sexual and reproductive rights, healthy and quality nutrition, the right to health for immigrants, and to prevent gender-based violence. 
Now, my colleague Angelina is going to talk um, about popular education and the EPES project. Thank you, Sonia. Okay, to uh, share a little bit more about our work, we want to say that our work is based on popular education theory and methodology. Uh, the objective of popular education is to transform the world through organizing collective action. Um, here, I will share with you some key aspects of popular education. And here we can find no educational process is neutral. Popular education takes a stand in favor of social transformation to straighten the organization of excluded groups. Finding collective solutions also starts by problem posing a reality. Here we have an image designed to generate reflection that portrays a poor neighborhood of Chile. We use this image, we use images like this that Paulo Freire called a code or a generative theme when we work with the community groups. We share this drawing and ask, what problem does this child have? What are the causes of the problems? And what can we do to address this situation? Popular education also generates the active participation of communities by strengthening organization and social relations. People um, should be active in their own learning process. We learn by doing. And local intervention must be relevant to the situation, needs, and conflicts of the particular community. Here we have another reflection generating image that shows a nutritionist using technical language to speak about nutrition, while on the other side, we can see a community meeting with people reflecting about the problem of food based on their daily experiences. Popular education recognized the capacity of the community itself to explore and pose related to the context in which they live. Knowledge is built through interaction between people. And now I would like to share a little bit, some details about one of the projects that EPIS is working right now at the present time. And this project is called Nutrition, Justice and Health. Well, the project has two main areas of action. Um, the first area of action is local and national advocacy carried out through the Community Coalition on Nutrition, which has helped build, which we helped build in the district of El Bosque in the southern zone of Santiago. This coordinating board is comprised of public employees who work in the Municipal Department of Health, Environment and Education, along with EPES and local community organizations. The coalition also has developed actions and educational materials to create greater community awareness of the importance of promoting the right to quality and sustainable nutrition. To accomplish these actions, meetings had been held in person and also virtually, as well as workshops on a range of topics. Um, for people who participate in this coalition and also for the community at large. Here you can see some of the pictures with the people gathering and having virtual meetings and also in the garden. And also when, when, it was, when we were able to get together um, face to face, one of the first pictures, but. Um, and now the second area of action uh, of the project and in general, and all the projects that EPIS is doing is uh, training and ongoing technical assistance for community organization, especially for women's group, geared to a strengthening local organization and their autonomy. 
In 2017, the Siembre Cosecha Salud, Plant and Harvest Health group was founded. Here you can see a picture of the women that are part of that group. Uh, in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, uh, it formed a community gardening group, a collaborative effort made up out of three different women's group. This area of work has generated training on nutrition as a human right, community garden, composting, natural pest control, and workshop to learn to bake um, sourdough bread together. Here, there are some of the pictures, as I said before, uh, we had during the pandemic last year, we have several um, different workshops that we had to adapt the technology into the context that we are um, living glo globally. So we have some pictures here where the women are starting to plant and they also are the sourdough bread workshop and also starting to arrange the, um, to build the Alco community garden that you can see at the bottom of the slide. And it, um, it has also generated interest among the local organizations to create gardens in other neighborhoods and other parts of El Bosque. Here's the group of women gardeners. And here we have the Auco community garden with the, the latest harvest of vegetables. Um, that is a very great experience. Here you can see the women together in the garden, which has been a space for women. And more in these hard times that we are going through um, to practice to practice collective care and also an there it was an opportunity to heal, to be uh, with each other, to talk about the things that are concerned about in this hard time. Many of them felt very bad because um, we had a very long locked <laughs> in in the houses and it was hard for them to go out. And so the garden was a place that it was very comforting for them. Um, and to finalize the part of the project, I, wanna, I just want to read a, a, a very brief testimony of one of the health promoters that is also part of the gardening group. She said, um, we have to give the importance to things that really matter not to consumerism that envelops you. The earth is resting from our aggression. And once again, we are reminded that organization and working together with our community, with our community health groups, give us strength. In the words of Maria Carrasco from last year. And I will go give the word back to Sonia for some final reflections. And that's it. Tania. Thank you. Uh, to conclude, uh, we would like to share some reflections about the contribution of popular education to community health work. People become strengthened and recognize their own capability as protagonists visualizing themselves as active agents for change. Training is built based on the knowledge and abilities people already have. It is trained them community organizations. Action address immediate problems while also searching for long-term solutions. The community defines his problems. Women see the lives of their families, their communities, and their own lives transformed. Training sessions and workshops become spaces for sharing and dialogue about our inherent wisdom and experience. And they also enable people to accompany and sustain one another in times of uncertainty and instability. Education does not change the world. It changes people who will change the world. Paulo Freire, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sonia and, and Angelina. And thank you, Susanna, for providing 
support for them with the PowerPoint to help give us the visuals and of the of the work that that you are doing. Um, wow, I am just amazed at the fantastic work that people are doing to support um, learning and unlearning and bringing people together um, to to reflect on and build uh, a better lives for themselves, their families, their communities and societies. Uh, a gigantic thank you to all our speakers. I will now open the floor to comments, reflections, learnings and questions from the audience. Um, I know there are some questions that were posted in the chat um, as well as some shared in the Q&A. So, um, so yeah. Uh, so one of the questions that was shared for, for Sarah in regards to, to your work, what are the linkages that are with um, governments? Um, you spoke about the linkages with, uh, with the International Label Organization and UNICEF. What about with national governments? Um, well, both ourselves as the Federation and all our affiliates are not direct, there's no direct influence of government. On them, they are member-based organizations. Um, so the linkages that we have now currently in the program for this year are to try to engage our, um, our, our, our affiliates in the education that they're doing to put as one of the learning objectives um, a discussion on how the change agents, the trade unionists, the uh, community uh, activists, the leaders of the member-based organizations, how they are engaging government on the issues. So uh, towards some education on opening up dialogue and with politicians, parliamentarians, councillors, et cetera, to raise the issues. So we work on a tiered system. Uh, what we do is we aim to uh, empower the facilitators, through pedagogics, through methodology, through uh, thematic topics, um, to do the coursework with grassroots leadership who have to do the work um, of mobilizing, organizing, and advocacy. And so, but no part of this is the government intervention or engagement, except on that level, uh, on the national or grassroots level. Great, thank you for that. Um, there is also a question posed um, in regards to um, connections and, and the role and work that, that is happening in regards to climate change and um, for, for Smita and, and Kapila, but I think the reality of climate change affects everybody. So I'm gonna open that question up to all speakers if you feel inclined to respond to perhaps one key action or activity in regards to um, learning in and for, um, adult learning in and for in response to climate change. So um, since the question was specifically asked towards Sewa, can we start with um, Smita and, and Kapila in regards to that question around climate change? And then we can open it up to others who would like to respond. Do we have time? Because we do a lot and Kapila Benkin shared several things on that. So it's very interesting and very important. so yes, this is a very important and a sensitive topic for all of us, as you very rightly said. So we have uh, lots of programs that we run for that and uh, lots of awareness uh, programs also. We have a lot of focus on solar-related trainings as well for the environment friendly. And uh, 
I think we um, developed many training courses and awareness programs in that regard. Uh, and our members basically take it across to all of them uh, with that. Thing. I just meet up in Matawan no Mudlau, Kaja, Tarapa Sukore, Chetaman, I care among them. Huh? Ah, the Philippine. Hi, I can also call Jarapa Matawan, but Lau no Tatu and a Benona, the clip Tatuana, to Abramna, Abra mobile to voice message across the Benona Sota, Kem Kemna number of people of Hoyche, Kebab, Eko, Ekata, Hoyche, Pasijarap, the Sarkaniko, Yudna Hoyna, to Emopara Sabina Jarkari after Hoyche. काके भी ते वातावरण ना बदलाव में सुसु करवानु होए चहें साथ है कापर जे खेती वाली यूनिवर्सिटी करी ना यानी साथ है पर आपर शब्द बनो ना आपर लिंक करे चहें ते ये लोगों पर वातावरण ना बदलाव ना ऊपर ना मोबाइल ने ना मैसेज छोड़ता होए चहें we have uh, we pass on the awareness messages through voice based message or even we have tied up with the agriculture university and also have pamphlets and posters and messages through WhatsApp groups that how we disseminate the information so that our farmers do not face the uh, effect of it. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Smita and Capilla, for responding to some of the ways that you are working in addressing climate change. Is there um, speakers from another organization or others who'd want to respond to how you're addressing climate change and in regards to the, the learning needs? I mean, it's a constant dynamic that we're all facing and, and as such requires all of us to engage in ongoing learning to, to adapt and also to unlearn ways and ways of thinking that we've held so close for so long. So if there's, um, I'll open the floor, so please step up, speak up. Yes, sorry. I don't know what happened to my putting, raising my hand thingy. Uh, oh. <laughs> no uh, we have climate change as one of the key thematic areas for the next two years. And we're working with affiliates of StreetNet, which is the global uh, uh, association for street vendors. And this year, uh, it's being led by the Zimbabwean Informal Chamber uh, uh, for, uh, uh, sorry, um, Informal Chamber for Economic uh, uh, Activities. And so they, they have partner organizations in Zambia and Malawi who are also organizing informal workers. And the three of them are working on it. So we phased it into three three years. The first year last year, it was linked up with the skills course on photography and creating a YouTube clip under the Foundation Skills Popcorn and Politics. Um, and every association got some, uh, uh, had to take clips of how climate change is affecting their work as street vendors. And then they had to put it into a YouTube uh, 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 presentation using the course. And then they had to present it uh, to uh, the, if we are a uh, global knowledge community. That was year one, which was observation. Year two, which is this year, they are designing courses in their own countries with their own organizations, because these are associations of informal economy uh, organizations in the country um, that get together under the uh, 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 umbrella and then affiliate to StreetNet. Um, and they are, discussing the topics that they want to advocate and the levels that they want to advocate on, whether it's municipal level, whether it's um, a social issue, whether it's a, a, a financial issue. Um, and uh, so that is what they are doing this year. Um, and, and the course is very open. Um, essentially, they dialogue in around what are the key issues. And then next year, we will start the mobilizing and advocacy element of the education. So all of this is designed with the StreetNet uh, 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 leadership and the educators. And at the same time, StreetNet is running a 
training of facilitators course for negotiating, no matter at which level they negotiate. And that's a separate uh, course that they're working with us on. Um, so we are, because the topic is climate change and how to fix the poor, we've chosen street vendors and domestic workers uh, as our key uh, uh, organizations, but the domestic workers have chosen the migrant protection a protection of migrant rights is their theme, the Domestic Workers Federation. And so that's what they're working on this year. All of this throws up the most amazing data um, and anecdotes, uh, which we are trying to develop a database to collect um, so that we can look at how to enable these organizations to track their progress in the work that they are doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow, that's great. Yeah, Angelina? Yes. Um, well, in EPES, as part of uh, the food security uh, project, uh, we have been reflecting on the impact that, um, that the, the climate change has on the ecosystems. And the way that its food is generated uh, has um, Right now, force people to move from one place to the other, and and also degrading the land for planting, and also leaving community without water for human use. I mean, for having uh, to use the water, also for producing um, food. It's very hard for us because we have to adapt to the impact that the, the climate change has. A, especially in terms of, um, of the food security. That's, that's it. Sonia, you wanna say something else? I can translate, no? Yes, sí, uh, decir que EPES, tiene, una de las líneas estratégicas de EPES es el trabajo en emergencias y desde ahí también eh, se aborda el cambio climático, pero hasta el momento en participar en coaliciones eh, que están preocupadas por el tema. So, and also say that one of the strategic lines of EPES, of the EPES work, is to articulate with other uh, international organizations that are actually very concerned about uh, the subject and working together with it, just to raise awareness about the problem. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, there was well, to all, there's one more question that I'm going to put out um, that it was asked to all, all presenters and um, I ask if you, um, if you wish to, and the question is, how do you, let me just pull it up here, if, um, share your thoughts on your process for engaging participants in, in dialogue and bringing people, maybe also bringing people into their circles or your metaphorical circles or kitchen tables as they were during the Anaganish movement. Um, to, to engage people, because sometimes we know it's important, but how do you get people to come in um, and take that first step for this learning? So um, I'll open that up if somebody would like to share. Uh, maybe maybe Dwayne or Dr. Ron, if you wanna talk about how you uh, reach out to um, the community members to, to and, and how do you get them to come into the workshops or engage in the different programs that you have going on right now? So uh, one example that I would use is uh, <clears throat> during the uh, pandemic, uh, we had an outbreak of COVID in one of our communities where we work and um, public health asked us to uh, to be uh, sort of a go-between uh, between them and the community because there was some historical distrust of public health in the community. And so um, we took the opportunity to um, arrange meetings between the community uh, and public health and brought in a number of different groups in the community, the ratepayers group, a youth group, um, different uh, church uh, groups, as well as uh, leaders uh, in the community and uh, just um, ordinary uh, citizens there in order to break down some of the uh, mistrust that was there, 
try and get uh, information about where the cases were originating and um, the attitudes of, of people towards uh, things like social distancing and wearing masks, et cetera. Uh, it was just at an early stage of, of the immunizations, but that became uh, a big part uh, in the community and that's still ongoing trying to uh, get people, particularly youth where there's a lot of resistance to being uh, immunized against COVID uh, to try and engage them and get them involved. So as I said in my part of the presentation, we're community-based. We don't, we're not just coming into the communities from outside and then leaving. Uh, we try to be part of the community, you know, to be on an ongoing presence and to keep a role uh, with people so that they know who we are, where we're located and how to reach us and, and how to advocate. Thank you. Yes, Sonia. Sí, el, ¿cómo lo hace EPES? Bueno, EPES está inserto, eh, tiene una inserción de largo plazo en las comunidades con las que trabajamos. So EPES has a long-term relationship with the communities that we work with. Y cuando tenemos que trabajar, a hacer un taller, alguna actividad, un curso, eh, nos contactamos con los líderes de la comunidad, con las organizaciones y las visitamos en forma personal. And when we have to do a workshop or different training courses, uh, we get in touch with the leaders of the communities and we go there and visit them and get in touch personally to invite them to be part of uh, the different uh, spaces of training. Y les preguntamos cuáles son los problemas de salud que tienen. La gente se moviliza y participa cuando siente que sus problemas y sus necesidades son consideradas. And so we go with them and we ask them, the first thing we do is we ask them what the problems are, what the problems they think they have. And people moved and start participating when they feel that they, they are taking into account their opinions about their own problems. So Entonces, that's how we start. Muchas, invitamos a la gente a las reuniones y las primeras conversaciones son cuáles son los problemas que la comunidad tiene y generalmente para que lleguen 20 o 30 personas invitamos al triple porque sabemos que no toda la gente llega. So we we started having like first meetings and then we get in touch and then we ask what the problems are and what they think we can do to help out because it's not it's not up to us to come into as the doctor said it's not we're going to come and fix everything but we have to take into account their own opinions and um and sometimes when we want to gather 20 people for one training course, we have to triple the amount of people that we invite. So they actually count 20 people. Sometimes we have to do 60, 80 people, and then 20 people show up for the training. So nada, a lot of nada, effort. Nada reemplaza el contacto personal. Muchas personas creen que a través de... WhatsApp o, o a través de carteles en la comunidad, la gente llega. Nada, nada reemplaza el contacto personal que la gente te conozca y establezca una relación de confianza contigo. So, nothing replaces the personal contact with the people. Some people say, you know, you can uh, post an announcement on WhatsApp or different uh, red social, but uh, it's very important to, to get in touch and to actually get to know the people that you're going to work with. And that's it, Sonia. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you, Angelina, for translating. It's greatly appreciated. Sarah, did I see you put your hand up? Sarah, you're muted. Sarah, you're, you're muted. I think perhaps I should wait until Capilla uh, speaks. I think okay. that she yeah, yeah. Okay. Smita and, and Capilla from Seva. Yeah. So I uh, just wanted to share a little bit about the decentralized structure that we have because we have the leaders from the village and the community members itself. 
so that entire chain becomes very easy for because the leader is from the community itself so the trust element is built in and we can get the participation of our members and uh, the as i said it's sister to sister kind of a learning and we have uh, we organize these members trade wise so each trade wise we have members and then representatives that take their questions from the rural level to the federation level and we have spearhead team members so agivans we call as village leaders and the spearhead team members are the link between the uh, executive committee and the grassroots members so the demands from the grassroots members are taken through these leaders and whatever um, decisions are taken that is transferred back to the grassroots level and of course we are using various other every month there is a face to face meeting and the leader also goes to the villages and now that since we have technology we also use lots of um, whatsapp groups or voice based messages to which we disseminate but for us every decision is made consulting our members it has to be participatory and coming from the members Thank you, Smita. Uh, Sarah? Yes, uh, we are not able to pinpoint our methodology as freely and necessarily because of the fact that so many of our affiliates come from regional participatory approaches, which there are similarities with the Freerian, but not necessarily uh, the same thing. We're fortunate in that because our affiliates have partner relationships with membership-based organizations around either worker identity in the community, citizen rights, or workplace rights, um, that they have a catchment of uh, uh, partner organizations who are actively working for social change. Although some of the worker education associations in the older uh, social democratic countries Australia, New Zealand, England, um, uh, much of their work is not even related necessarily to social change. It's related to uh, lifelong learning and having a full participation as a citizen in that uh, 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 country and as a member of that community. So we have the commonest methodology which we do subscribe to is the study circle a model as applied in the Nordic countries, because we find that's like the lowest common denominator that goes for every approach from the Gandhian approach of the uh, Indian Academy of Self-Royed Women to the strictly Freerian of many of the Latin American countries. It encapsulates the sort of ABCs of participatory decision-making, of deciding what you're going to learn, of deciding how you're going to learn it and of equipping the facilitators to do the work that they must do. Um, so we have uh, uh, the two programs that we have foundation skills for social change, which are really skills for volunteer educators or community educators or trade union educators and the study circles for social change, which are skills of involving from the real ground um, involving people in deciding what they need to learn, why they need to learn it, and uh, how they're going to put it together. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers, Smita, Kapila, Sarah, Duane, Ron, Sonia, and Angelina for speaking and sharing with us today. Community development is a significant learning site, learning about our oneself, colleagues, peers, humanity, community, and society, learning about pressing issues and learning how to do what needs to be done. If you're interested in exploring upcoming Cody International Institute online courses, please check out our education's program webpage. Note that the applications have recently been extended uh, the first courses will begin um, later in September, so um, it's a fantastic opportunity to meet with practitioners and curious people from around the world. Um, there have been some posts in the chat courses that link specifically to the topics that speakers have spoke on today. Um, also, if you're interested in the Masters of Adult Education program at St. Francis Xavier University, we have a research-based program which provides an opportunity for students to go deep 
into a topic that's of their own interest. We also have a specific online cohort. Um, most of our programs have gone online right now because of COVID, but an online cohort on adult education, women's leadership and community development um, applications due in October. That program starts in January. Um, links will be posted in the chat as well. And I just, I'm so grateful for the words, the time, the interest and energy and curiosities that you have all brought today um, for us to explore this important and timely topic and practice. And I just wish all of you a very wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Thank you.